All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Brentwood High School. I'd like to thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, before I start, I just want to introduce a few people that are here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce Ms. Ortiz. Uh, she's our assistant superintendent for secondary education. Uh, Francisco Herrera, our athletic director, is here tonight. And Karen Gross, she's our new transition coordinator. Thank you, thanks for coming. And all my counselors that are here, thank you out there in the hallway helping out. I'd like to thank you guys for coming out. And parents, students, thank you for coming out tonight. I uh, hope you enjoy the evening and get lots of information. You're in for a, a, a treat tonight with Coach Wayne Mazzini. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Wayne. Uh, he began his NCAA coaching career in 1992, has since coached at Fairfield University, Holy Cross, Sacred Heart University, and is currently at University of Bridgeport. He's a 1991 graduate of Gettysburg College, where he played both football and baseball. Mr. Mazzoni also holds a Master of Science in Sports Administration from St. Thomas University. Mr. Mazzoni is the author of several books, including Get Recruited, The Definitive Guide to Planning College Sports, and has been, on, uh, a, on, and has been a guest on nearly all U.S. sports radio stations, including WFAN Sports Radio 660 in New York. He has appeared on Fox, ABC, News 12 Connecticut, and other television programs. Since 1998, Mr. Mazzoni has led recruiting seminars at over 300 high schools, as well as at the New York and New Jersey State Athletic Director Conventions. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we'll get the night started. How about a round of applause for Coach Wayne Mazzoni? Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to move around. We're also streaming this. Uh, we're having it interpreted my first time ever, so I'm going to try to speak a little slower than normal, but I'm going to get you guys tremendous information. And this process can be stressful. It can be overwhelming, the college process in general, and then you add in the recruiting process. And what I'm hoping to get here tonight is a way to empower you to move your process forward. And Ultimately, this process falls into three main steps, so I'm just going to give you about a 60-second overview of what I'm going to present. The first part of this process, you have to identify the right kind of schools for you as a person, as a student, and as an athlete. Every sport in the country that has about 3,500 colleges that have that sport. So if you play soccer, there's about 3,500 college soccer programs. Your job is to try to narrow down which ones might make a fit for you for a variety of reasons that we'll get to. The second step of the process is you've identified schools that would be a great fit for you. How in the world do you get these coaches to know that you're an athlete at Brentwood High School? How do you connect the sides and start the recruiting process? And then the third step is once you are actually being recruited, what are the things a recruit faces ultimately before they make a decision of where they want to go to college. Before we get to those three steps, a couple of things to go over. First of all, hopefully you can see the screen from where you're sitting. I got smart a couple of years back and came up with this little system. If you can see this number, 678-506-7543, and you text the word recruit into it, the entire PowerPoint presentation will get sent to you. So I no longer have to put out copies, anything like that. It will just automatically go out that you'll have. And I see a lot of times people taking pictures of the slides. This saves all of that. If you want to take notes, great. But the whole PowerPoint will go out to you if you want. All right. To get started on the, the bulk of the talk now, you can yell this out if you'd like. Feel free. Would anyone like to guess what percent of high school athletes across all sports go on from high school to play in college. <laughs> Keep yelling it out, whatever you got. 30%. 1, 10, 30, I heard. 
The answer is 7%. So 7% of high school athletes make it to play at the Division One, Two, or Three level, or the NAIA level, or junior college, community college level. It's competitive to be a college athlete. This may be a little difficult for you to, for you to see where you're sitting, because I can't see it from here, but I'm the oldest guy in the room, probably, or close. It's hard to see these numbers. What this says here, and I'll get up closer and I'll read out one of them. This is the participation rates, first for men, and the second slide will be for women, that the NCA tracks. And it says there are 482,000 high school baseball players. I'm only picking baseball because it's at the top of the list. There's only 36,000 college baseball players. So 7.5% of high school players will play in college. And it even goes further to break it down. 2.2% of those are Division I, 2.3% are Division II, 2.9% are Division III. And then again, if your eyes are good enough, you can look at the sports that are listed up there. The NCAA doesn't track every single sport, but about 12 or 13 of them. Here's the numbers for the women. So again, at the top is basketball, 400,000 women's basketball players in high school, 16,000 in college, it's 4.1% that move on. So I'm not here to open up the night to crush your dreams. I'm, open, I'm here to say a lot of people want this, but it's very competitive, especially when we're talking athletically. So a question I get asked a lot, what do I have to do? What does my kid have to do? What does a player and my team have to be or do to be one of the 7% that play in college? I think it comes down to four things. Number one is a no brainer. You have to be good. You have to be very talented. You have to be very motivated. And then of course you need the physical traits that work for your sport. Obviously in basketball, helps to be taller. Track, helps to be faster. Football, helps to be bigger. So college coaches are looking for the best of the best that are really talented but want it too, that are motivated. That means a lot, that are motivated and that have the physical traits. Number two, to be a serious student. I'm not here telling you college coaches want you to have a 4-0. What they don't want to do is recruit an academic headache. College coaches coach college over high school because they get to pick the team. So if I need one point guard in the class of 2024, I'm gonna look at about 50 of them and I'm gonna narrow the list down. And if 10 of them I'm really worried about academically that are not serious about their grades, I'm just gonna move on to the other ones that are serious. So you, you can be a C student and be a serious student because you care and you're motivated about your grades. Number three, you need to have an understanding of the recruiting process, which is very confusing and overwhelming. And COVID and the transfer portal, if you know what that is, has made it only more confusing. So most people through friends, social media, coaches, they know about 30% of the process, 40%. Just enough to be confused of what to do. And that's why hopefully by the end of this night you go, oh, I do this, then I do this. If this happens, I go this way. You have a, a, a way to manage this process. And then the final piece of it is what is your plan to develop? In a variety of ways. Are you sleeping enough? Do you eat properly and get enough nutrition, right? We were talking about you guys, Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches can get you a long way, but if you need to gain 20 pounds to become a prospect, I carry a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in my backpack, okay? Strength training, skill development, academic plans. What is your plan to develop? Because college coaches could see a bunch of ninth graders and pretty much from our experience say, that one's gonna be division one, this one probably is not gonna play in college, this one is division three, most of the time will be right, but a lot of times things will change because kids either physically mature or all of a sudden changed habits and became different people, right? The best famous story we all should know is Michael Jordan didn't make his high school basketball team or varsity as an 11th grader. That's a fact. So if the greatest basketball player of all time, in my opinion, we could talk LeBron another time, 
got cut in high school, didn't make his dreams in high school, but worked at it, anything, anyone can accomplish anything with goals and motivation and habits, okay? So what we're gonna do starting the next slide is get to the beginning part of this process. To me, the process or the slides get easier to cover and then get harder as we go along. The first thing I'd like you to do, and this is what you can do with your guidance counselors or if the school uses Naviance or College Board, you're trying to figure out which schools would fit you, not counting sports, okay? I'm gonna give you, I gave you one slightly depressing number tonight, and that number was 7% of high school athletes play in college, which means 93% don't. It's about 43% of college freshmen across all sports that play their sport in college for four years. So a lot, have played since five and played soccer, basketball, tennis, whatever they play, and their dream is to play in college, and then they get to college, and after a couple of years, they don't play anymore. Why would that be? Let's yell it out. Why would someone stop playing a sport in college? All right, well, you could say that. They're not that, honestly, he said, well, I'm not gonna say what he said, but you probably heard it. They realized, I'm not very good. There's a lot of way better players than me. I'm not playing, I'm putting in a lot of time. I'm not good, good enough, or coaches recruited players over me and there's no place for me anymore. Or it says up there, the broken leg scenario, I get hurt, or my academics are suffering, or I need an internship, or I need to get a job to pay for school. Um, my grades are going down. You get a boyfriend or a girlfriend, all of a sudden playing is not that important to you. And the reason I'm bringing this up is, if you pick a school that you don't really want to go to only for the sport and the sport piece doesn't work out, chances are you'll look around and, and won't want to stay at that place anymore because you were there only for the sport. So listen, playing sports in college is fantastic and if that's a reason to get you to go to college, fantastic, right? My own child who's going to college next year, He's going because he loves sports and he's gonna do his academics, but he doesn't wake up in the morning and go, I can't wait to get the chemistry. He wants to play sports and that's fine. That's his motivation to get him to college, to get his education, to get his degree and to move on, okay? So what I'm trying to get you to do here, and I'll put all these things up on the screen now. I don't know why I'm pointing it here when it goes over there, but. You're trying to narrow down what kind of schools fit you not your uncle, not your teacher that wants you to go to Adelphi because they went to Adelphi. What's right for you? So do you want to stay on Long Island? Do you want to be in the Northeast? Do you like a small school? Do you want a big school? Are you a city person? Do you want to go to school in the city? What do you want to study? If you want to be a, an engineering major, your list of colleges should have engineering on it. So you're looking for any reasons to start shrinking this list. And I, as I had said before, there are books, websites, um, College Board and Aviance, I'm sure the school uses one of those, and you have guidance counselors that can help you with this. Nothing beats going to see schools. I'm not telling you to do an admissions tour or to meet a college coach, but if you told me I'm going up to Boston, for Christmas to see family, I would tell you to look at eight colleges on the way up and eight on the way down. Go look at URI, go look at UMass, go look at Sacred Heart University, go look at Southern Connecticut, go see St. John's, go look at Manhattan College, go look at Babson College, go look at Northeastern, just getting on campuses, because watch this, if you're an athlete in the room, a student athlete, raise your hand if you yourself have been to more than 10 colleges. Not you, you're not an athlete anymore. Lola looks like you're in good shape. Has any athlete in this room been to more than 10 colleges? No one raised a hand. Yes, you guys? No. So the point is you're at a lecture to talk about college and college recruiting, but you kind of don't know what you like because you haven't been out there yet. So if all of us in this room decided tomorrow we're gonna go meet at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And we all walked around campus. And at the end of that visit, we all told each other what we thought of it. 
This group over here will love Rutgers and would be thrilled to enroll in the place. The middle group would go, Rutgers seems nice, but I'd like to see other schools. And the other third would go, I hate this place, it's too big, it's not for me. There is no right or wrong answer um, that anyone can give. It's what's right for you. But you won't know what you want until you get out there and you see the school. And one thing I will say, you can see it's the fifth one down there. It says cost. Of course cost, the cost of college is insane. We all know that college is overpriced and is crazy. What I would not do in the beginning stages is I would not go, gee, forget me going to look at Fordham. That costs $73,000 a year. Fordham is insanely expensive. You have no idea what you would qualify, qualify for academically and athletically and other sources of money. So I would not be scared off in the beginning for the sticker price of any college. Later in the process, you might go, well, they said it's gonna be this much, can't afford it, fine. At the end, cost is a big factor. But in the beginning, absolutely don't do that because I coached 16 years at Sacred Heart University. It cost $65,000 tuition, room, board, and books a year as a private school. The average kid on my team paid $26,000 to $27,000 a year. Now, still a lot of money. Still got to take loans. Less than half the cost if you just looked it up in a book. Okay? There are monies for college. So if I was working at the school here, I was, I was a counselor, I was a coach, and you came into me and said, Coach, really want to play college soccer. I would say come back and see me when you have 10 or 15 or 20 schools that you think you would like, that you'd be happy at as a student and as a person for getting soccer. Once you do that, we're ready to start talking about the process, okay? So you can see it says there at the bottom, you gotta start as if you're not, the sport is not gonna work out the way that you want it to. All right, the second piece of this process of trying to narrow down schools, and I'm gonna, put this together after this uh, slide in a way that completely makes sense. How good are you at your sport? It's very, very, very hard for you to figure out how good you are at whatever sport you play. And the people generally giving you the most feedback are your parents. And unfortunately, your parents are the worst judges of athletic talent on the planet. There's two reasons for that. Number one is they love you, right? Your parents love you, right? Your family loves you and they say, oh, of course you're the best in the field or you're not starting, the coach is, you know, he doesn't like this, it's political. The parents love you, okay? The second reason is more important. You are looking at yourself compared to other kids at Brentwood or other kids in Nassau or Suffolk or Long Island or if you play on a travel team, you're just looking at how you compare to that group, which is what I would do. However, you're not a college coach looking at kids in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Florida and Texas and California. And I know soccer is big at this school. 16 years, I sat next to the soccer coach at Sacred Heart. You know where he went for players a lot? Out of the country is where he went all the time. And it was 19 languages coming out of his office all the time. Right? And we see with the World Cup. So you might say, well, boy, my son or daughter looks pretty good. Maybe they must be a Division I athlete to be able to play at Clemson and Penn State and Wisconsin. Maybe. Maybe they're also pretty good, but not good enough to play anywhere in college. So I'd like to give you some things, and I would advise you to do them all. And I'll put this all on the screen now. The more you can do to figure out how good you are, the much easier the process gets. Because what a lot of kids do is don't ever do this and just go, yeah, I'm a Division I player and then they'll spend all their time emailing coaches or maybe paying for expensive camps to go to these things. And meanwhile, they're at all these big schools that they can't play at and they're passing up opportunities at schools they could. And by the time they realize they should have looked at Farmingdale, Farmingdale's moved on to other kids. So if you, if you don't do this properly, it will put yourself behind. I was trying to make a reference, but I have two things in my hand, but I'm gonna do it anyway. 
The biggest problem that most people have, and by the way, I my dream would be everyone here tonight gets the perfect school. If it's Division One, you get a great scholarship, you have a wonderful experience, okay? But what most kids think is that here's my high school level of sports. Division three is a smidge over that. Like division three is 13th grade sports. That's my backup plan, it's a piece of cake. Then there's division two, and then division one is this massive jump. And that is completely incorrect. It is high school level of athletics, the massive jump to division three, then division two, and division one. So, and if you don't believe me, ask anyone in the room or anyone that you know that played Division III sports in college like I did. It's not a joke. Everyone was fantastic and a team captain in all county and really, really, really good. And again, the percentages play that out. So you need to do some homework to find out where you stack up at this stage. And the earlier you do it, I'm not here to rush the recruiting process on anyone. You guys are way more stressed than when we were in school. The first time I played in front of a college coach, I was in college. Now the recruiting process is completely different, especially with social media, which we'll talk about. But I think the time to figure out, if you're in ninth grade or 10th grade, you go, I would like to play my sport in college. That's the time to figure out how good you are. Because now if you get a variety of people to tell you and give you feedback that you're not fast enough or you're not skilled enough or you can't do something, you have time to work on it. What most kids do is never ask, assume they can play division one until they get no interest from coaches and then just go on and don't play in college and they never get any feedback. So number one, I would ask the coaches that are with you all the time. Your high school coach, if you play on an outside team, if you take lessons somewhere, I would absolutely ask them. And this is a good time for me to say this. You may not like this, but this is the fact, in my opinion. It's not your athletic director's job. It's not your guidance counselor's jobs. It is not your coach's job to get you recruited. It's your job. You can get help from these other people, but everyone is busy, everyone has families, everyone's teaching, everyone has responsibilities, and no one cares more about you or your own kids than you. So I think you have two things that you should expect from your high school coach, and this is one of them. A meeting and say, coach, I, you know, I'm a junior and I wanna play, um, I wanna wrestle in college. What level do you think is right for me? I'm sure your wrestling coach either wrestled in college or has been doing it a long time and knows all the kids in the team what level they probably can play at because that's what they've been doing. Not to mention, they're with you for a year or two years or three years. So they have, they're probably the best person to assess what the right level is for you. So the coaches that you're with on a regular basis, you absolutely have to have a conversation with. That's one. Number two, if you have any friends playing your sport in college, from Brentwood, or from anywhere that you know. Maybe they're a freshman now, and they're coming home for break, and they've had a fall at the college level now. I would absolutely ask this person, how are you doing at this Division II school you do? Are you 30th person on a 30-person team? Are you gonna start immediately? How do you fit into that level? How do you think I would fit into the level where you're at? Should I shoot higher? Is that, would that be good for me? Should I shoot lower? The more feedback you can get, the better. Camps and showcases. I wanna talk about this briefly. I'm, I'm sure we all know what I'm talking about. These events that are ultimately meant for recruiting, which I'll talk about when we get to that next step. But these events have two main purposes to help you figure out how good you are and also can be done in a way which is not that expensive. So for example, if you play field hockey, I would consider going to the Stony Brook field hockey camp, okay? It's not some big one run by a business that's gonna cost you $600 for three days. The Stony Brook field hockey camp is gonna cost $75 to $100. And you're gonna get two things hugely out of that camp. One, a lot of these camps grade you out by college coaches. 
We saw you play for two days. Here's your strengths. Here's your weaknesses. We project you as a Division Three field hockey player. If you want to play Division One, you've got to get better at this, this, and this. You actually get evaluated by someone who does that for a career. The second benefit you get is to be around the other 75 girls, 80 girls, whatever they have at that camp, who all have a goal of playing college field hockey. And in your gut, you'll know how you stack up to this group. If you're in the top four or five talented players at that camp, you're a Division I scholarship field hockey player. But if you go to that camp, and there's 80 girls, and you're like, 79 of these girls are better than me, you're probably not good enough to play in college, maybe Division three level. But it takes you outside of your own world and puts you in, a, in ultimately where the competition is. So I highly, highly advise you to do that as early as you possibly can, because then it gives you more time to change, okay? Absolutely doing this, watch the colleges play. My goodness, that's why I underlined it, bolded it, and gave it five exclamation points. What makes the TV is football, basketball, and for the most part, the high level of Division I. But you can't go to any place, and I'll just stick with field hockey for a minute. You're not gonna find Division Three field hockey on ESPN, okay? And even if you do, we all know every sport looks a lot easier on TV. So what I would advise you to do, if field hockey is your sport, is I would go watch St. John's practice or play field hockey and go, oh, that's what Division One field hockey looks like. Then I'd go to Adelphi and I'd watch them practice or play and go, that's what Division Two field hockey looks like. And then I'd go to Old Westbury and go, oh, that's what Division Three field hockey, field hockey looks like to get a better idea of where you stack up. You could go see Division One and go, wow, I thought they were gonna be unbelievably better than that. Maybe I can play at that level. And you could also go to the Division Three and go, holy cow, the size, the speed, the talent. Wow, this is really incredible. And even if you told me, I wanna go to school in Georgia, Louisiana, or Florida, why in the world am I gonna look at three schools play field hockey on Long Island? Because D1 is D1, D2 is D2, and D3 is D3. And the more you can see, the better off that you'll be. I'll tell you right now, it's the single best thing you can do to get on track with where you stack up to the college level. The last part of this, and hopefully you can see it from where you're sitting, is this is much easier for individual sport athletes. If you swim, if you run track, if you play tennis, if you play golf, to some extent wrestling, but not as much. You, if you have a time, if you run the mile, just let me, let me do it with the mile. If you're a miler and you run the mile in five minutes to five minutes and 15 seconds, that's a division three mile. If you run the mile in 4.30 to 4.45, that's a division two mile. If you run the mile in 4.10 to 4.20, that's a division one mile. If you want to run at the five perennial powerhouse division one programs, track and field program in the United States, you need to be at a four or below. End of story. The mile is the mile, no matter where you run. And unless you say, well, I haven't matured yet, or I haven't gotten the right coaching, you are what you are in an individual sport. Whereas you could say, I'm on the softball team here at Brentwood, and you can try to tell a college coach that you hit 425 last year and you've been starting as a freshman and you only made three errors and no college coach will care whatsoever. College coaches do not care about your, your team sports stats unless you've done something ridiculous over the top that they just can't you know, look away from. Does anyone want to guess why your high school team sports stats don't matter as much as you might think they, they do? The reason is it does not tell the level of competition. So for example, you're playing basketball and you're averaging 38 points for the season. But your team has played four games, three games against teams that were awful and you put up 55 points every game. 
And then in game number four, when you played a really good team that has four college commits on it already, you scored nine points and you had a rough night. Well, add up the four games, the average looks outstanding, but it doesn't tell the, the detail. And it doesn't tell where the hotbeds of basketball are, or soccer are, or softball, or whatever the case is. So I'll talk about in the next slide what they are looking for, but a lot of people think, I'll just email a college coach, and I'll send them my stats, and I'll just hang out and wait till the phone starts ringing. You're gonna be waiting a long time if that's your plan, okay? So what you're trying to do is narrow your list down by the following. So oftentimes I pick somebody out of the audience. I'm not going to do it this time for a variety of reasons, but let's just say hypothetically someone raised their hand and said, I would like to go to college within five hours from Brentwood. So 3,500 colleges shrink down to about 800, maybe 1,000. And then they say, well, I want to be near a city, but not in a city. The list shrinks down. I like, you know, no fewer than about 5,000 students, no more than 15,000. And all this could change. But if you don't start somewhere, it's very overwhelming process, unless you're one of the better players in the state of New York, okay? And then you say, I want to major in this, and I have a 2.9 GPA, and maybe I took a PSAT, and here's my scores, and you start shrinking it down and shrinking it down, and then you say, and I did some research, and I am a Division II likely lacrosse player. Maybe some of the better, or the lower Division Ones, maybe I could play at. All the Division Twos that were on my original list I could play at, and maybe some of the better Division Threes I can play at. And that could be three, five, ten schools that are a great fit for you, who have some place to start. Most adults know this. The adults that have, you know, that have careers in certain fields. Well, I wanted to work in accounting and I want to work in Manhattan. Okay. You have an area, you have the job you want to do. There's accounting firms in, in New York City and you do a variety of things to get those places to know about you and hopefully hire you. It's much the same here. But if you just go, I'll do any job anywhere in the United States, I don't care. Finding a job that's gonna be right for you and make you happy is gonna be difficult. Colleges are very different experiences, and if you do your homework, you'll number one, get your money's worth, and number two, you won't wanna transfer, especially as an athlete, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So I'm gonna do questions at the end, and I will also talk to people individually if they want to come up at the end and ask a question. But before I get to what I consider the next section of this, is there any questions from anyone about anything I covered so far? Okay. So this slide here starts to get to the second phase of the process. You have a list of schools that you think fit you. For whatever, however you got to that list of schools. Okay, how do you get the college coach at that school to know you're a living, breathing student athlete from Brentwood that wants to play in their college program? And hopefully you can see again what it says up top. And this might be the most important part of the whole night. Most kids, and we said before, 93% of high school athletes don't go on to play in college. And I would guess, out of those 93%, 85% never got as far as even having one conversation with one coach where the coach said, your grades aren't good enough, I'm sorry, this is not gonna work. We don't need your position. Sorry, this is not gonna work. You're not talented enough, we think you're pretty good, you're not good enough for this program, we have players that we like more. Most never have any idea what to do and never have one conversation. If you get a college coach on your list to tell you, hey, we checked you out, we watched you know, film, we talked to so-and-so, we just don't think this is the right fit, you should be psyched, psyched. Because you don't need 20 yeses, you need two or three yeses from schools that you like, they like you, and all of a sudden now you have the place that you want to go to college, okay? So what I want to talk about here is how you go from an unknown 
to someone that is, gets evaluated by a college coach. And I'm gonna put it all up on the screen right here. Now, you can stare at that, and while you're looking at that, I wanna make this point that probably you've never thought of before. Most people think recruiting as a college coach is easy. They just sit there and go, I want this kid over there from Lindenhurst, and I'll take this kid from Brentwood, and I'll take that one over there from Massapequa, and yep, that's it, recruiting's done, took me a week, I got who I wanted. You know who that works for? Nick Saban at Alabama and Krzyzewski when he was at Duke, and the big powers that have all kinds of pull. For everybody else, recruiting as a college coach is flat out brutal and overwhelming and incredibly hard. And I'm gonna tell you why, so that you realize, boy, I better do stuff on my side because I didn't realize they had it that hard. Except for football that had bigger coaching staffs. Your average college sport has three recruiters. So what does that mean? That means at Providence College, three of the coaches can recruit. Three human beings are responsible for recruiting. Basketball is being played all over the United States at you know, uh, probably 25,000 high schools. How many travel teams? How many tournaments? It's overwhelming, okay? Then you have NCAA rules. You have budget restrictions. You have that their season is your season. Right, so you have a big game on a basketball court where you're playing something on Friday night and the college coach also has a game going on, right? Which again is why travel and summer recruiting is big. Not that it's more important in high school, it's because the coaches aren't coaching and that's their time to be able to come see you. And then, not to mention this, the coach finds a player they like and they call the player and say, listen, it's coach so-and-so from such and such a school and the kid goes, coach, it's, I'm really flattered that you call, but I'm not interested in, in that school. It just doesn't fit. You're going to get rejected five out of ten times when you're coaching. So it's, it's a difficult process from the coach's side. So what I advise you to do is absolutely you're going to have to do a combination of these three things. And the number one best thing you can ever do, it should be obvious, is be seen playing in person. Have a college coach come watch you at the high school, see you on a travel team, see you at a tournament, see you at a camp, any way that you can do it. And it's easier to do when your list is narrowed down. So if you said, my top school is Hofstra, Hofstra is going to recruit. If you called up the tennis coach at Hofstra and said, coach, where will you be June, July, and August to recruit? They will tell you already. They know what tournaments they're going to, what players they're going to watch, when they're running their own camp. Well, coach, geez, I see that you're going to be at such and such a tournament. Well, I'm going to sign up for that tournament so that you could be there and you could tell me once and for all whether you think I could play tennis at Hofstra. But if you don't have a list of schools, it's very difficult to have the two sides meet. So your obvious your goal is to be seen playing in person as much as possible. And I referenced this before, and I want to talk about it even further now. The cheapest, quickest, most efficient way to do all this is to go to that college's specific camp. Now, I know you might be thinking, well, he's a college coach. Of course, he wants to have everyone go to the camp. This is how co coaches make money. You all should know this. There are businesses that run camps, so I'm sure you've seen a Nike ID camp for soccer, where 12, 15 college coaches are gonna be there over two days and it costs $1,000, right? Which could be worth it, even though it's insanely priced, because if there's six coaches on your list that are there, maybe it makes sense. However, if you wanted to play at Hofstra, Hofstra is not allowed, nor is any college allowed to do tryouts which is why there are camps in the first place. If there weren't the rules about tryouts, the coach would say, yeah, come on over from Brentwood, we'll throw you right into practice, we'll tell you at the end of practice if we think you're good enough. That's not allowed, so that's why they run camps. Camps is the way they recruit a lot of their players. A third of college rosters are from their own camp. You get a benefit, here are the benefits to going to a specific school's camp. It's the cheapest. Number one, 
Number two, you get to see the college and the facilities that they have. Number three, their entire coaching staff is there. Over the course of any day in the summer, one coach is in Maine, the other's on Long Island, the other's in Maryland looking at players, communicating back and forth. Oh, I saw this girl, I like, here's some video. At the camp on their campus, all three of them together, girl number 12, red jersey, that's the girl we like. Thirdly, girls or guys, players on the current team work those camps. So you can actually talk to kids that are playing on the team. Do they like it? Are they happy? If they had to do it over again, would they have picked that school? And then, of course, in one way you make it easier for the coach because the coach knows you like Hofstra because you wouldn't have wasted your time to go sign up for the Hofstra camp. So that's a huge thing that you can do, and it's as simple as going onto the websites of the schools you like and looking at their camps. And if you haven't done it, you'll realize they're extremely, extremely cheap compared to all these other camps. Um, Video, let's start with this. Raise your hand if you have video you can send to a college coach right now. I see one, two, three, four in the back, five over there. Every single one of you, whatever your sport is, must have video that is on your phone, that is on YouTube to send to a college coach. I don't care how that video is. If the school films games, great. If your mom's got to sit there with an iPhone and record it, great. If you got to give a buddy from the school 10 bucks to film a game, great. If it's going to be a practice, you're going to set up a tripod and film yourself, great. In fact, college coaches don't want it to be professionally produced and filmed and have graphics and smoke and Metallica music. Because that makes us think, you're not that good, you have to sell us with this fancy video. Just get anything, any video, and I don't care what the sport is. Every sport recruits a little bit differently. Football uses video predominantly, and not that we're here to talk about one sport in particular, but football does not have travel teams. Football does not have contact camps where you go to a college camp, put on a uniform, and play a game. So they look at video, and just about every high school that I know films on a thing called Huddle. Players are able to mark their plays, and they have an easy system to send to college coaches. The rest of you, if the school doesn't film, and I know most schools don't film games, you're gonna have to come up with some other way to do it, even if it's a practice or your own kind of workout. But especially if you don't, if you wanna get looked at by Towson University in Maryland, that's a seven hour drive, and you don't have any video, it's gonna be difficult. You have to have video. I'll talk more about that in a second. The third thing which is up here, since COVID, it always was important, since COVID is now the biggest thing that needs to happen. And it says a trusted reference. You must, if you wanna play, have somebody that can call for you. Because if you write a college coach or you talk to a college coach, you're not going to say, you know what, I'm kind of lazy in the classroom, I don't really, I, I'm, I'm a pain to the teachers, I sleep in most mornings, I don't really like lifting weights, I can't hit a free throw at any time during crunch time. Uh, but coach, you want to give me a call and recruit me? Everybody writes, I'm the best, I'm the greatest, and it all blends in and a college coach has no way to verify anything. But if a coach calls, your high school coach, your travel coach, an alumni, a scout, a pro, somebody that has some reputation in that sport, you will 100% of the time get looked at. So this is the second thing I think you should expect from your high school coach, is that not that they sit with you an hour a week or go through everything, but that you do this, for example. Let's say you've done all your homework and you say to your high school coach, Coach, you know I want to play in college. I've done some visits. I did the following things. I've got two schools. I've got Manhattan and Iona that are my top schools. Could you call them for me to tell them how, what kind of player and person I am and see if they'll you know, start the process with me? If you give your high school coach very specific things to do, 
I bet you they do it. If not, I know someone who will bust their chops to do it. But if you just sit there like many do, oh, my high school coach doesn't you know, help me. It's not in their job description. I'm not bailing them out, but they teach classes or they're outside of the district or they coach another sport and they have families, they have a lot going on. So to, for them to manage the recruiting process of 15 kids on the team, not gonna happen. But for them, for you to say, coach, can you please call Manhattan, please call Iona, my top schools, the coach should do it unless he or she doesn't think you have the talent to play there, in which case they say, dude, I love you, man, but you, I don't think you can play there. I can't call and tell them about you. That, that's not, I can't do that for my reputation. Plus, you would not be happy. You probably wouldn't make the team, and you're not going to get any interest. It's a hard conversation to have, but it's important. So it says on here, under the notes, it says, and this is really important, everyone recruits differently. There's different age coaches in different sports and different levels. I know certain coaches, and they mentioned I wrote a book before. Every time I update my book, I have a list of about 250 college coaches that I send a survey to to make sure everything that I'm saying is still current, has anything changed, how does soccer do it, different than tennis. And what I've learned is everyone recruits differently. At certain schools, not one video will get watched until they talk to somebody about you. Or they won't go to see you unless they watch the video first. Because coaches don't wake up on a Saturday and say, goodbye wife, goodbye kids, I'm going to uh, New Jersey to watch this tournament for three days, I'm hoping I'm gonna find somebody. That does not happen. They go, goodbye honey, goodbye kids, I'm going to Jersey, to watch three kids that I heard about. I talked to their high school coach, I watched their video. These kids are really good. I wanna now watch them in game action to see if they're good enough for the program. And then maybe while they're there, they see three other kids who they didn't know anything about that they start to learn about. But again, because of how overwhelming recruiting is, they try to make it structured, okay? So there is no one way that's magic. There's not just a magic camp. There's not just a magic way to do a video. You have to do it if you want it, and this is important, and I should have said this in the beginning. I ask people all the time that ask me about the recruiting process, and I say this to them. How much do you want to play your sport in college on a 1 to 10 scale? If your answer is 7, 8, or 9, honestly, you got to. it's not going to work. And I'm not telling you you should want it. You might say, I don't want to play soccer anymore. I want to do the violin, I want to write, I want to act in the play. Awesome. Who said sports would be the way you had to go? But if you, your answer should be on a one to 10 scale, I want to play college wrestling, I want to wrestle in college, 16 on a one to 10 scale. Everything I do is for that goal. If that's the case, you should be doing everything humanly possible to move that process forward and you never know what it's going to be. You never know what phone call, what video sent, what event you go to is gonna be the right one that's gonna to lead to that outcome because this is not an exact science, okay? Couple of other pieces to mention here before we move on. I don't know if in this district, like every other district, you're bombarded with what I call recruiting services, NCSA, College Prospects of America, whatever you wanna call it. My advice to you is run like the wind from every one of those places. Do not waste your hard-earned money on any one of these places. I've been doing this talk for literally about 24 years, and at the end of almost every talk, somebody comes up with their head down and says, I wish I would've known not to go with one of these recruiting services. I paid $2,500, I've gotten nothing out of it. The bottom line is, it's not, it would be nice if it was simple to say, all right, here's money, you handle my process for me. You have to do it. There's not a recruiting service that I know that's worth any money. There are two cool recruiting things and you can't get on the list. So here's what I mean by that. In football and basketball, there are people that rank the top 300 players and that rate five star athletes. And then the college coaches with the big budgets at the football and basketball programs buy those lists of kids from the coaches and then they recruit those kids. 
The only way on that list is to be tremendously good. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat, and you had to take that call. I hate every recruiting service, and I advise you to stay away from every one of them because scam may be too far, but I don't know many success stories with recruiting services. Okay, last part of this, and then we're going to take any questions, and we still have a, a decent amount to talk about in another section of this process. Is I get asked all the time, when's the right time to start? When is the right time to start the recruiting process? There's a few ways to answer. Number one, when you're physically mature and ready and think you're at the place where you're ready for people to see and evaluate your game. I said earlier, in ninth grade it wouldn't be bad to get evaluated, to just know I, I gotta work on this and this. But for the purposes of recruiting, when you feel ready, skilled enough, talented enough, strong enough, that's when it's time. When you feel mature enough to actually call a college coach or get on the phone with a college coach is when it's time. There are a bunch of rules that you probably know about. The rule is that a college coach can't initiate contact with you until September 1 of your junior year. Okay, so that means only 23 grads and 24 grads should be allowed to talk to college coaches right now. Yet, does anyone in the audience know of a 25 or a 26 that's committed already? Absolutely we do. How does that happen? It happens in legal ways around that, especially in football, especially in basketball, through a variety of ways that are legal. So most people sit and think, well, yeah, as uh, soon as September 1 comes of my junior year, boy, I'm going to take off school that day because I'm going to be getting so many phone calls it's going to be scary. And nothing happens. So the right time to start this for most is junior year. Junior year, the summer between junior and senior year is another big time. The bigger the sport and the power five schools, the ACC, the SEC, the bigger the school and the bigger the sport, the earlier they recruit. So let me repeat that. The bigger the sport, the bigger the school, the earlier they recruit. So even there are some uh, Division three schools where there is no scholarship money for the sport that are still recruiting kids now for the following fall. Maybe some of you are in that process now. All right, I'm gonna move to the next piece. Are there any questions just on what I covered here? Don't be shy to ask a question. I know it's a decent sized group. Sometimes people are uncomfortable doing it. So we'll wait till the end or go one-on-one. -on -one. All right, this is my least favorite slide, but it's important that you understand what this is. And then there's a drop down that's gonna come down here in a second that is gonna be difficult to see, but again, if you get the PowerPoint sent to you, it'll be easier. This slide and the remaining few are now saying you're being recruited. We're talking about maybe some of you in the audience are already being recruited. Maybe some of you are a month or two months maybe six months, maybe a year away from being recruited. And so we're on the same page. Being recruited means a college coach calls you on the phone. A college coach texts you. They set up a Zoom with you. They FaceTime with you. They DM you on Twitter or Instagram. They visit you at the high school. They ask to come see you at your house. Uh, they invite you up for a visit. They talk to you after a camp or a tournament or a game. That's being recruited. If you go, gee, I wonder if Boston College is recruiting me because I got this in the mail, the answer is no. When it becomes personal is when you are becoming a recruit. And when you become a recruit, you have a variety of things to face, and this is the first one. For Division One and Two, there are rules when you graduate high school that you have to meet certain requirements to play as a college freshman and it's called the Initial Eligibility Clearinghouse, and I'm gonna explain it in a simple way. The first thing you need to know is your grades matter. They matter starting in the ninth grade, all the way through senior year. So you can see up on the screen, if you're gonna play Division I, when you graduate Brentwood High School, the NCA wants to know what your GPA is in the 16 core courses, English, math, social studies, science. Every high school in the United States has courses designated NCAA courses. 
There's 16 of them, freshman through senior year. When you graduate, you can be no lower than a 2.3 in those 16 core courses, a 2.3 GPA. And then if you have a 2.3, there's a corresponding SAT or ACT score that you need. Now, I don't wanna to go too bogged down in this. Since COVID, they've waived the board score. The NCA has said, People haven't been able to take tests. You don't need to submit your SAT or ACT scores. The question is, will the 24 class need to be able to do it? Will the 25 class, the 26 class? We all hope it goes away, and we think it's gonna go away, because most of you know by now, college admissions are making tests optional. But as of now, if you're a 24 grad, you're gonna to need to meet a certain core GPA and an SAT or ACT score, which I'll put up on the screen in a minute. And then if you have a three, five or higher in those 16 core courses, you need a lower SAT or ACT. So the lower the GPA, the higher the board score needs to be. The higher your GPA, the lower the board score. And I'll put that up in a second. It's a sliding scale is what it's called. Division two. There is no sliding scale, you have two minimums to meet. You need to have a 2.2 GPA and an 820 SAT minimum. Now, let me also explain this. These rules that I'm going over are only about can you play as a college freshman. You could still get admitted into the school, you could still practice with the team, but if you graduate not meeting these requirements, you can't play in any games as a college freshman. And assuming you have good grades as a freshman, you can play as a sophomore, junior, senior, fifth year senior, or graduate student. You don't lose your eligibility, it just gets delayed. This is the NCAA's way of saying grades matter, okay? Now, I'm gonna go over two more things on this slide. If you think you are a Division I or II athlete, you go to the NCAA website, you click this button here where it says division one or two, it's gonna be a half an hour's worth of information you have to put in. They charge your credit card $90. There might be a waiver that you might be, I remember seeing a waiver when I did it for my own kid, but I'm not positive. And then your high school gets notified and sends in transcripts for you. And then the uh, college board would send in appropriate SAT or ACT scores if needed. If you're a Division III athlete or you're not sure you want to play in college, they ask you to go fill out all the same information, pay nothing. And then if you stay Division III or you don't play in college, nothing happens. If you wind up going Division I or II, then you switch your profile over and pay that money. Okay? Now, this, I'm going to click it forward. You'll want to see this. It's going to be a little difficult. So this is the Division I sliding scale published on the NCA's website. So you can see from, we'll start with the top left. It says if you have a 3.55 GPA in the 16 core courses, you need a 400 math and verbal or a 37 ACT composite. And then it goes the other way where if you have a 2.3 GPA, you need a 980 SAT or a 75 on the ACT composite. And then there's a whole area here in the pink that says academic red shirt. Hopefully you can see it. If your GPA is a 2.299 and then you meet a corresponding SAT score, that's called an academic red shirt that's what I talked about before. You're in the college, you're on the team, you're practicing, you cannot play games. Okay, so that's an area called academic redshirt. If you're below that, which is not even something that's on the screen, so if you have a 1.9 GPA, instead of being an academic redshirt, you can't even practice with the team in college. Okay, you still have eligibility, but you can't practice with the team. Most places advise that you start thinking about this in your junior year. If you're gonna be a serious division one or two athlete, most likely, you're gonna to go to this website, fill it out, and then the high school will update the transcript. Because at some point, maybe some of you have already had this, a college coach, which we're gonna to get to in a little bit, is gonna ask for not only your transcript, but your NCAA ID. 
which is what you get when you register. And then we take your NCA ID, we put it in our system, and every grade you've ever taken comes up on our computer. So now we know that we're recruiting someone that's going to be eligible and that has the academics to get into to the school, okay? And again, if we have questions on this, we can get back to it in a minute. All right, this kind of switches gears a little bit, and what I'm trying to impress on this slide, you don't have to read every word, is that many of you, the recruiting process will get intense. You might have two schools, three schools, five schools, 10 schools recruiting you. We were just talking about serious recruits that have come out of here in the last several years. The process gets intense, and then you start to go, wow, which one of these places is the right one for me? How do I start comparing schools to know which is the best place? Now, this is part of a college coach's job. Here's why you should come to Wyona. Here's what you'll get academically. Here's what you'll get athletically. Here's our facilities. Here's where our players get for jobs. Here's what it's gonna cost. That's what recruiting is. But sometimes they either leave things out that are maybe a weak spot that you need to look for to ask before you become someone that enrolls or says yes quickly and then gets in there and is, doesn't like it and wants to become someone that's in the transfer portal, which is gonna pop up on the screen in a minute, which I'll explain. So there's basically four areas that you should be explained by the college coach or you should be asking. The first one is academics. Man, it seems like a whole lot of time playing Division One hockey here. It's a lot of time. How do we coach? How do we manage athletics and academics? Is there tutors? Is there study hall? Is there a requirement for me to keep my academic money or my scholarship money? What happens if my grades go down? Do I lose my money? I've heard stories of kids that didn't realize the coach wouldn't allow them to major in certain subjects because those subjects conflicted with practices and games. So the bottom line is, you're going to college not only to play your sport, to get an education, to get a degree, and to get a job. So coach, what does this university do to help manage athletics and academics at the same time? Number two, what are the coaches really like? Do your homework. Every year, you'll learn about three to five coaches that get fired because they were having a miserable, you know, they were running the program in a terrible way, and the kids never did their research. They only talked to this college coach on the phone or met them in the office, and they didn't really investigate what that coach or that coaching staff is like. So I advise you before you make a commitment, talk to current players on the team, talk to parents of current players on the team, or watch a practice, watch a game to see what their style is, okay? Third thing, what, why are they recruiting you? What do they like about you? How many other girls are coming in in the recruiting class that play your position? How many other girls on the team now play attack like I do that I have to beat out to get playing time? Are you gonna switch my position? Are you gonna redshirt me? Am I gonna play as a freshman or maybe I've gotta wait two years because it's an upper class heavy team? Again, you're the customer. College is very expensive. It is your right to ask these questions. And frankly, you'll impress coaches when you say and ask these types of questions rather than just sit there and go, yes, coach, and you don't have anything to talk about. It's the same way in the job interview. They're asking you questions, but they always say, do you have any questions? It's good to ask questions to the person interviewing you. It shows you really want the job. It's the same way here. Coach, I was on your website, noticed that you have three goalies. I'm a goalie, that would give us four. And are you recruiting any other goalies? And that might be five. Hey, that's, that's a really good question. Well, three girls are listed as goalies. One is a goalie, but she's really not. She really plays defense. You'll impress somebody by asking a question like that. And then I call it philosophical things. It's a goofy way to say it, but things like this. Does that university have a strength and conditioning coach? Do they have a full-time trainer with the team? Do they have a team doctor? Do they have a concussion policy? Do they have a drug testing policy? Um, what are the parameters if you get hurt? 
and you need surgery, who pays for surgery? How do they travel? Do they travel by plane and buses or do players drive themselves or coaches drive you in vans? Um, do they have to give you full equipment or are you responsible for your own equipment? Washing it, buying it? Do you have to fundraise? Many colleges, the first thing you're gonna do when you get to the school, welcome to the team, here's $5,000 in raffle tickets you have to sell. What? Right? So you need to ask these questions because I've worked at six colleges and I've seen how very different they are and you might go, well, geez, I'm just happy to get recruited. Well, if you don't ask the questions, and you get there and you realize it's not what you think, watch this here, which I hate to do it, but it's important that you see it. It's difficult, I'm gonna just yell it out. This is from the last time that I signed into the NCAA transfer form, and I'll explain what that is. Currently, there are 29,547 athletes that wanna get out of where they are. Who knows what their reason is? Playing time, don't like the coach, academics, coaching change. They brought in other transfers and now they don't have a spot anymore, they wanna leave. Let me just do this. Raise your hand if you even know what the transfer portal is. Okay, a decent amount. Let me explain what it is, because it is important to know. You could always transfer, at any time since the NCAA started, you could transfer. But the rule was, and there were certain circumstances, the rule was you had to sit out a year of playing the sport. So if you went from Duke to North Carolina, you had to go one year of taking classes without playing. In basically the middle of COVID, they said the year in residence, the, that one year is gone. You can immediately go from one school to the next and play right away. And that's made movement happen all over the place. And it's made it very difficult in a lot of ways. I've talked to a few college coaches that have told me, we used to recruit 12 high school kids a year, now we're going six transfers and six high school kids. Because we'd rather get a 21 year old in here than a 17 year old. Okay, and that's why I say everybody recruits differently. But the point being, a lot of these athletes in this transfer portal didn't ask questions, just said, yes, coach, sounds great, coach, awesome, commit, here, enroll, and get there, and it's completely different than they expected. So my advice is to do your homework, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move on. Okay, your next piece. How do you use athletics to get into the school, even a school that may be one you would not have been able to get into without athletics? And we could go through this in a number of ways, and I started to change the way I did this because I think it's more helpful. This is what every college coach does in the country. They find a player they like, and they've determined this is a talented player, call you on the phone or text you and say, can I get a copy of your transcript? Every one of you, if you're serious, needs to have a copy of your transcript on your phone. Doesn't have to be official, it could be unofficial. Because if I ask you for your transcript and it takes you two weeks to get it to me, do you know what I think? I'm the first coach that asked, maybe this is not the right kid, maybe I'm missing something. When I ask a kid, can I get a copy of your transcript, and whoop, it comes right back, I go, yeah, this kid is in it, they understand, they got the transcript. So that's important to have an unofficial copy of your transcript available. What coaches do is they take the transcript and they fill out a cover sheet. It has your name, your date of birth, your address, your cell phone number, your email, social media accounts, your intended major, are you a scholarship candidate, a tryout candidate, are you honors eligible, and have you had any discipline issues inside or outside the high school? That sheet with your transcript goes to admissions and then it magically comes back with this information on it. One scenario, I put up there calling it A, admission says it's not gonna work. They haven't denied you, because you haven't applied, but they're saying right now, on this date, this person's not admissible, 
to which every college coach will tell you the same thing. Sorry this didn't work. I advise you to look at a set of schools like this. I'm going to move on and look at other players. Now you could say, it's been said to me many times, well I'm having a really good semester. Can I get my next report card and send it to you? And I say, absolutely. But being that that's two months or three months from now, I'm going to have filled this spot recruiting-wise. Okay? So the better your grades are, the more options you have, and the more money you'll get for it, which is what we're about to get to. What a coach is hoping for, and you're hoping for, is that admission says you're admissible. Now note, they didn't say you're admitted, because you have not applied yet, but they say, at this point in time, you, if your grades stay in this general area, would be admissible to the school, which is fantastic. And then what you're hoping for is an academic award. So again, I've been at six schools. The lowest academic award I've seen is $6,000, and the highest is $25,000. But what most college coaches do is find out how much academic money you're gonna get, and then sit and decide how much, if you're a scholarship level athlete, how much scholarship money they're gonna to add to that, which is what we're gonna talk about in a minute, okay? So you'll be told, I got you, and this happens early. This could happen in sophomore year, actually. It could happen this time in your junior year. I mean, I've seen kids with three semesters of grades go through this process, okay? One thing I wanna mention, I'm not gonna get into it in detail because even at every school I've been at, it only qualifies or, or applies to a few kids, is if you're looking at a high academics uh, type of school like the Ivy Leagues or the NESCAP, if you're familiar with that, like a Williams or an Amherst or a Tufts, you need to Google what's called the academic index. The high colleges, the high academic colleges Recruit based on a formula of your GPA, the course levels that you've taken, your class rank, and your board scores. And there's a formula that's published, it's not secret, that you need to know what your index number is. Because if they ask you, hey, what's your index number? And you go, I, I don't know what you're talking about. It's going to be weird. Okay? You should be able to say, I'm a 276. So I can give you more detail if you want to ask me about at the end. But if you're a high academic student athlete, that has to be something that you have to understand and be able to speak that language of. Okay, really two more things to discuss and appreciate everyone's attention. Um, this is a squintable one again also. This is first for the women's NCAA sports. This is the amount of scholarships allowed by the NCAA but it takes a little bit of discussion so you know what these numbers mean. The left column is division one, and the right column is division two. So for example, women's basketball division two is allowed 10 scholarships. So the closest division two from here, let's go Malloy. Let's say Malloy costs $30,000 for room and board, tuition, books. 30,000 times 10 is $300,000. That is the Malloy Women's Basketball Scholarship Budget. That is not for every incoming recruiting class. That's for the whole program at once, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, fifth year or super senior grad student. And what every coach does, okay, it's not that difficult to do, is say who's graduating, or who said they're transferring, and what money were they getting, and that's the money available for the next group of incoming freshmen or transfers. So if $112,000 is leaving the program, there's $112,000 to spend on the new girls that are being brought in. Now, there's only two sports, I'm sure no one in the room knows this, and maybe your athletic director does, possibly, but it's, most don't. In football and basketball, you either get no nothing or the entire cost of the school. It's either nothing or all. And when I say all, tuition, room, board, and books. 
And then there's NIL money, which I'm not going to get into for those of you that even know what that is. Any other sport can be a partial scholarship. They can give you $5,712. They can give you $13,005. It doesn't matter. They can do whatever amount that they want. But generally, the coach is going to say, you got $13,000 for your academics. We're going to match that with $13,000 for soccer. And there's a $26,000 scholarship offer. And they might say, well, that's 45% of the cost of the school, or it's a 50% offer. And then they might put a deadline on you. We'd like to know by the new year. We'd like to know by Christmas. We'd like to know by Friday. I've heard all kinds of things. I've heard coaches that fly players in and do a tour and do the whole thing and say, we're offering you this, but it needs to be, before you leave the office, we need to know if you're taking it or not. Everyone recruits a little bit differently, okay? And then, of course, at that point, you would get offered and you would you know, make a verbal commitment, which I'm a little frustrated with because I think it's gonna change. Kids verbal, co or coaches offer kids verbal, and then when the kids change, it doesn't bother me, but since this transfer portal and COVID, coaches are rescinding on that. I've heard more stories in the past uh, fall than I've ever heard before. You would never do this as a college coach. It's the worst thing you could do for your reputation to offer a kid and take it away, it's terrible. So I think that's gonna be ruled by the NCAA and that's not gonna be allowed to happen any longer. But at the moment, it's a verbal until you get a national letter of intent where you actually sign and that commits you to the school. Here's the number for the men. You'll see, of course, football is the biggest number. There's 85 football scholarships. So let's talk about that for a second. So when you watch a bowl game and Ohio State's playing and there's 110 kids on the sidelines, 85 don't pay for school. The rest of the kids are recruited walk-ons. And it's a good time for me to explain the difference between a recruited walk-on and a walk-on. A recruited walk-on is someone the coach desperately wanted, a really good player that probably had a lot of options but wanted to go to Ohio State, the coach either had no more scholarship money left or didn't think the player was good enough yet, but guaranteed this person a roster spot. That's called a recruited walk-on. As opposed to a true walk-on who looks for a sign in the athletic building that says football tryouts, soccer tryouts, basketball tryouts, volleyball tryouts, you're not gonna make the team when that's the case. There's, the amount of kids that truly walk onto a college roster is, is like hitting Powerball. It's extremely difficult to do. Now, one thing for you to realize is that every number that's been put up here is a, is a number put up by the NCA, meaning this. Even though it says you're allowed 9.9 .9 soccer scholarships, that doesn't mean that every college has to give out 9.9 .9 soccer scholarships. They can't give out more than that, but they could give out less. They could give out three scholarships or four scholarships. Why? Because everything in the world has a budget. A university has a budget, an athletic department has a budget, the soccer program gets a budget. And they might say to the coach, we've allocated four scholarships for you. That could be $200,000, the coach could give that to five players that he thinks or she thinks are tremendous, or they could spread it out between 20 players and give everybody a little piece however they want to do it, okay? So you'll know you're a scholarship level player. Typically when the coach calls and has been recruiting you and speaking to you and then asks for your transcript and tells you how much academic money and then either invites you for a visit or comes to see you and says, we'd like to make an offer. Okay, and then I get asked all the time, can I negotiate my scholarship? Can I ask for more? Of course you could. In any capacity of life, you can negotiate buying a car, job salary, a variety of things, and the outcome can go the same way any negotiation can go, which you can look up, there's like five ways a negotiation can go. It's the same exact thing when it comes to scholarship money. But it's not rude of you to say, you're my top school, 
you've offered me $30,000, these other two schools have offered me $42,000, but you're my top school, is there any chance you can get closer to this? Absolutely worth doing. And that can get you more money, or they say they don't have more money, there's a variety of ways to go, but I wanted to mention that. All right, my last slide before our questions. There's that number again if you need it. Okay, I always feel silly saying this slide, um, not just because it's the last slide, but there are many kids here who are younger, maybe eighth graders, ninth graders, haven't visited colleges yet, and yet I'm here basically telling you how to make a decision on college. And the reason I do it is there are two awful times in the recruiting process. One is people around you are getting recruited, this is happening, you go on Instagram, he committed, she committed, you can't get anything going, it's miserable. And the second time is you have three schools you love, they want an answer by January 1, and you cannot sleep at night, you do not know what to do. So I give you two ways to think about it. One is all things being equal, I would go to the better academic school or school that's better for my major. If that's even, I would go to the school that's cheaper or giving me more financial aid money. Or I would go where the coach and you have the best connection, the coach really likes you, and you know you'll be one of her you know, girls or guys, meaning, hey, you have a couple of bad games, they're still gonna play, as opposed to another coach who's not really fully sold on you, and then you don't get off to the best start, and then you sit the bench, or you don't get to play much. The reality is, you should absolutely take a visit, go to classes, watch a practice, watch a game, eat in the cafeteria, go look at the dorms, go to an event on campus, and completely investigate what your life would be like at that school. And if the coach doesn't want you to do that, or allow you to do that, that would scare me off from the first place. Most coaches want you to do that. They want you to come up and say, see if this is for you. If it's not, no hard feelings, right? Because the kids that wind up transferring, it's terrible for them. You lose credits. You have to leave friends and start on a whole new team and you never know if that situation is gonna work out right. It's bad for the team because the team lost the player, it's bad for the coaches, and worst of all maybe, is the 10 kids that would have taken that spot, but they didn't because you did, right? So you wanna get it right the first time. So I, I really believe, and this is gonna sound silly, you should visit colleges three times. The first time is an under 10 minute ride around campus, don't get out, don't talk to a human being. Drive around and just go, do I like this? Because I've seen many kids do an admissions tour, meet a coach, it's a seven hour day, they took off school, except they drove to campus, they parked, they look around and he goes, never going here. And you're in there for the whole day long. So first visit, get a quick peek. Then maybe you go back and meet with admissions and meet the coaches, and then if it's down to your final two, you do this overnight, or you do this full day, and you really test drive and see what the school's about. And then if you do that, most kids that do it make a gut decision and are thrilled with their choice of college. Okay, let's do this now. As all me talking so far, appreciate you listening. There has to be questions. Every night there's questions. No one wants to ask the first question. So does anyone want to ask the second question? And I'm not letting you leave. We're barricading the door if you don't have questions. Yes. Do the college camps um, give out waivers to the students to go to the students so they don't have to pay for them? And if so, on average, how many do they give? You? Excellent, 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 excellent question. You, a college coach, cannot give a waiver to any athlete for any camp cost. Illegal. There's a bunch of rules on how camps are run, and that's one of them because basically they would, it would then become a triad. They would just say, hey, you five good players come into camp, no charge, which would be a triad. So on, now they can waive admissions, fees, and application fees, and all that stuff, but there can't be any waiver of a, of a school camp 
whatsoever? Good question. I know you didn't touch on this, but um, if you can just touch on some of the possibilities of JUCO. Okay, excellent. There is, there is many different ways to get to college. And certainly, I passed it on the way here, past Suffolk, and I'm from the island. I know Suffolk and Nassau. My God is junior college or community college an absolutely unbelievable way for many people to go. For a few reasons. Obviously, number one, start off being cheaper, right? Possibly live at home. The whole experience is cheaper. You now have a chance to get your academics up. You now have a chance to grow physically and get your skills up. Those colleges are a pipeline to the next level. So absolutely, 100% is that an option. Now, the other thing, and I'm not saying I promote this, but I've seen it happen in things of the, you know, athletics, college athletics have gone cuckoo since COVID. It's just fact. You may not see it on the outside looking in. But I see kids taking gap years now. I see kids taking gap years. The coach says, we're full in our roster. We don't want you as a 23. We'd love to have you as a 24. And you know what you do? You get a part-time job, you do an internship, you work, you go to the gym, you work out, you keep your skills sharp, you enroll a year later. That never happened before, so that's another possibility or an option. There's also post-grad schools, there's a variety of other different things, but 100% junior college, community college is a fantastic route, and shame on me for not bringing it up, and good job by you for reminding me, because, by the way, if you do wind up going to a four-year school, right, and you're using that for employment, people want to know where you got your degree from, your four-year degree. They're not asking where you started your first year or your, you know, your first 18 months or two years. And by the way, even if you did, fantastic. It's, now more than ever, with the cost of college, is it a smart move? Absolutely. Other comments or questions? That's two. We've got to get one more. All right, I'll give you a question then. And we'll make this the last thing, and then again, if you guys want to talk personally. And I don't know if it's, if this is becoming, in my opinion, unfortunately, less and less, um, but that's life, things change. I often get asked about multi-sport athletes. What do college coaches think of multi-sport athletes? Should I continue playing my two or three sports? Should I specialize in one sport? My advice, and I think I speak for just about every college coach, maybe not swimming, they seem to want you in the pool 24-7. College coaches love multi-sport athletes. We would love that you, maybe, of course, the sport we're recruiting for is your primary sport, but that you play another sport we love. Because you'll learn other skills, you'll deal with other coaches, and you'll, if you're good enough to play in college, you'll specialize for your sport in college for four years. The two sport college athlete is a unicorn now, is almost impossible, mostly at the division three level. But I will say to you, and I think I would speak for the adults here, most, and I can say from coaching in college, the biggest regret of the players I had in college is that they gave up their other sports in high school, where you're playing with your buddies and your town and your community, because you thought, well, I have to play an extra, you know, I gotta play hoops four seasons a year. God forbid I do something else. College coaches aren't gonna be won over by that. They're, they love a multi-sport athlete for a variety of reasons, and one of them is they were multi-sport athletes. Now, I know that's becoming less and less, and I don't know what the Brentwood district is like uh, in terms of specializing or not, but being a multi-sport athlete works in your favor as opposed to opposite. All right, anybody else? Anyone that needs it interpreted? Seriously, I mean, I'm happy to, whatever you got. All right, otherwise, that's it. Thank you guys so much for putting up with me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm happy to talk to you up here if you have any questions.